Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. Until September of 1983, no woman ever served on New York State's highest court. That most glaring absence ended on the 12th of that month, when Governor Cuomo appointed Judith Kaye to the Court of Appeals. And 10 years later, he appointed her to be the chief judge of the state of New York. And what a chief judge she was, not only a great reformer and innovator. Judith Kaye defined the importance and value a woman jurist is to a fair and balanced judiciary. Welcome. I'm so pleased to have you. So nice to be with you. So we talk about, I've always talked about a woman's perspective on public policy. Does having a woman, a woman on the bench really make a difference, do you absolutely, think? Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. How pleased I was to be the first, but how sad I was yeah. to be the first. Yep. Uh, Must have been an incredible kind of thing. Um, it was pretty terrific. Yeah. Uh, but imagine the court was like more than 100 years old before I got there, and there had never been a woman before. It's just amazing. And that's true all over the country, wasn't it? Or uh, isn't yes, it? Yes, and I think in these past, you know, 15 years or so, we've seen a big revolution. What's interesting is uh, I became the chief judge, as you mentioned, in 1993 after 10 years on the court. I was one of the first chief judges of a state court in the nation. There's a conference of chief justices. And then over the next 15 years, I saw more and more women ascend to that role. So that by the time I left, easily a third of the group was women. You know, So yeah. I, I think this is a time when the change is, is occurring. Happening. So well, we can really celebrate good. it and we can grieve it both yeah. at the same time. That and I think it's always, it, it seemed to me when I was reading, there, it's about 30% on all the courts. It's Interestingly a, enough. It's really know? moving up. I think all told, we're still in the 20s, but we're yeah, edging to the that. 30s. And at the same time, yeah. women are more than 50% in the mm. law schools. So what's happening between law school and the yeah. kind of career advancement that many women aspire yeah. to, which is the bench? And also to be a partner in a law firm? And to be a partner in a law firm, right. I, I have, uh, I've written, I love to write, obviously. Um, <laughs> But and I've done. You wanted to be a reporter at one time. How silly of me! Yes. No, it wasn't silly. Well, <laughs> imagine I could be a fired journalist yeah. at this point instead of a retired chief judge. <laughs> um, but I have written a lot about women in law firms because I started in a law firm uh, back in the year 1962. I started in in a law firm. Now those were the days. Oh my goodness! Uh, and I have watched a change. But again, I, the theme is the same. Nice that these things are happening. But at the same time, not enough, not enough, not enough, and too late, especially difficult in the law firms, I have yeah. to say. Is it having a family also that makes it complicated in a law firm? I, I think what happens, but, yeah, there's that, that uh, inarguable moment uh, when there are kids, family obligations, and it's the woman stepping into them, being the mommy. Um, and I, I just think we have to be a lot more sensitive at the law mm. firm level to uh, that moment in life, which doesn't last as you and I know so well. Yeah. Um, and we have to make opportunities for re-entry. You know, it's a very valuable asset that a law firm loses, never mind what the woman loses, when a person who wants to stay on after five, six years or so uh, just yeah. leaves, leaves the firm, sometimes leaves the law, which is really yeah. remarkable to me. But mm -hmm. it also, though, it's not only just the, that family track, whatever they call it. It's also single women don't necessarily become the partners either. It's still tougher yeah. for women, yeah. there's no question, because there's the quote-unquote rainmaking. Yeah. Still very, you know, a lot happens on the golf course and in these and on the it's clubs. The and it's the clients you have to bring in, you have the to, money you're the, making. That's right, and the billable hours. It, it, these are definitely profit-making mm -hmm. institutions. Yeah, and, and then the, the uh, parallel to that in the judicial system, it's having to know the politicians in power to make the appointments. Well, I guess the message, and you've hit right on it, is you have to know the obstacles and know how to work around them. Yeah. But fortunately, one good thing is that there are so many more of us around um, to give a hand, pat on the back, maybe you know a cup of coffee, a little a little yeah. help, and a little That's advice. That's what's so important, isn't it? The tremendous, support. tremendous. The yeah. support is tremendously important. Yeah. Uh -huh. Do you, um, when you became chief judge? Uh, when I talked about being an innovator or anything, I remember the difference about serving on jury duty. And that was you, wasn't I it? I guess that was <laughs> probably where I started, yeah. maybe one little step back uh -huh. with with matrimonial law. I think that was actually, 
I think that when I became chief judge, I was on a commission that my predecessor, Judge Walkler, had put me on, on matrimonial law, and I was in the midst of that, uh, running around the state in that investigation. So mainly, when I became chief judge, I think the first initiative, technically, uh, was that matrimonial initiative, but I had been a litigator for 21 years. I knew we could only improve the jury system in the state of New York, <laughs> and so that became my own first priority. And fortunately, I think things worked a little bit, and you know, you move the mountain a millimeter, and then you get heady with the things that you can do because everything can be improved, everything <laughs> needs to be looked at, most everything needs to be changed, don't you agree? Oh, and, absolutely. You know, you always, uh, I mean, that's what I think makes life worthwhile. Don't you think to have a goal to make a difference and to change make and make it better? Make better, absolutely. And yeah. the jury system, I mean, that strikes right at the heart of what we do because for most members of the public, coming in to serve on a jury is the first time you actually get to see the inside of a courtroom yourself. Mm -hmm. You see it on TV, you see it in the movies, but you can actually experience for yourself what a court system is like. When you leave the courthouse, when you leave that experience, you should leave with a good impression that the justice system is working well, not that you have wasted a day or two days or two weeks of your own precious time. You can learn so much, but most of all, you should learn good things yeah. about the court system. So now everybody is eligible to serve on a jury. Yes, actually, <laughs> technically, when that report went in, there was one exception, and that was for judges. Um, and the legislature, to its credit, deleted that exception. So in the state of New York, there is no automatic exception from jury service. You can be 105 years old, um, you can have 10 children, you can um, have all sorts of what had previously been considered automatically disqualifying mm -hmm. factors. Today there are none. There are things on an individual basis. I mean, we, don't, we have a system rooted in rationality. We have, in, we have individual exemptions, yeah. but no automatic, no automatic exemptions. Everybody is eligible to serve. Uh, and you've been called, have you? Oh, many times, <laughs> but I've never made the hurdle. Yeah. <laughs> Do they get nervous when they hear your name? Uh, I, I remember once somebody looking at me and saying, Your Honor, it's a pleasure to see you here. I knew I was going to be bumped. <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, it's Do you think that you were interested in that change uh, because you were a woman and you saw it right away? Uh, I think probably because yeah. I had litigated in the courts, yeah. I was most attracted to that. It just seemed to me, as I said a moment ago, to just be right at the heart of what we most needed to change because that was the most public exposure uh, to, to get the jury system a notch or two better. And then once it started, I mean, the people in the court system were in it 100%, you know, seeing mm. what wonderful compliments they could earn instead of all the grumbling and, and mm. complaints. They actually were getting compliments and praise. It's so good. Oh, it is. It's yes. wonderful now. It's yeah. fun. Uh, and you don't have to serve for such a long time. Well, this is what happens. Difference. What happens is there, uh, because all of the automatic exemptions were removed, you know, you can't serve if you're mm -hmm. under 18, mm -hmm. if you've been convicted of a felony. I don't mean things like that. But because all of those, those 23 or 24 automatic exemptions were wiped off the books, instantly we got, I don't know, a million and a half or so new people <laughs> to call. Yeah. And that meant that the burden was relieved for everybody. You know, suddenly, Very, yes, it, yeah. was, it was a great idea. So that made the times we needed to keep people in the court system uh, less, that reduced it, and also increased the times between periods of jury service. And now we're up to, I don't know, six years? Uh, it's amazing. Between. Yes, yeah. it's, it's, Just amazing. it's much better because that's, that's how it should work. Your time, your time is valuable, just like the court's time is valuable. Everybody's time should be respected. Yeah. The Court of Appeals is the final court for the state. Right. Yes, and why do we do that to people, you know? Right. To in, make in them every, go through no, one. No, I meant not oh. so much that as in every other state uh, uh, except, well, I'll tell you about two. The highest court is called the Supreme Court. Oh. In New York, we confuse people. It's called the Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court is basically the entry level of, of general everything. jurisdiction. Uh, then there's an intermediate appellate court called the Appellate Division of the Supreme and that's Court. A regional. Yeah, there are, the state is divided into four parts. Um, 
and uh, there are appellate divisions, one in each uh, segment of the state, and then the highest court. A second layer of appeal is called the Court of Appeals of the State of New York. So it has to go through all these states. You don't yes. really get things directly, cases. No. I, I mean, technically, maybe, there yeah. may be a, a, a reason for that right. sort of expedition. But basically, you go from the trial level to the intermediate appellate level to the highest level. And then when you're at the highest level, what distinguishes uh, the difference be the final verdict and being able then to appeal it to the Supreme Court? Well, uh, in fact, it is for all practical purposes the final level. Very few of our cases. Uh, in my 25 years, a handful at most uh, uh, cases went from the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States. Their docket has been greatly reduced. They have fewer than 100 cases a year, okay. maybe something in the area of 75 or 80 cases yeah. a year. Uh, so they don't take that many cases from the state courts, especially. They have a lot of cases. You know, we have a parallel system of courts right. in the United States. We have the state court system and we have the federal court system. The Supreme Court is supreme over both, but they have the greater part of their docket from the federal court, some from the states. And I say in my years, uh, very few cases went from our court. And I have to tell you, nothing hurts more than getting reversed. So <laughs> that, that was a significant thing. It but. must have been. What, what was it? Well, I don't oh, my goodness. Don't no, let's me. not go back there. Much. Right. <laughs> you, um, you had some pretty uh, noteworthy verdicts uh, or decisions in your court. What, what are think, some of the ones um, that it, stand what's, it? what's interesting, and just to pause for a yeah. second on the Court of Appeals, is it's kind of a luxury to get two appeals, if you think about it, which yeah. our state court system provides. Right. So you have to be really careful about what goes to the second layer of to the Court of I Appeals. See. And the Court of Appeals is also very selective uh, in what comes, and the legal requirements for getting there are are tough too, because you should have pretty much an automatic right to go one level to get another mm -hmm. set of eyes looking at mm -hmm. what the first judge has done. But to go a second level too, there should be something more about it. And what we say in New York is it should be an issue, a novel issue of statewide significance. That's kind of what defines the jurisdiction of the Court of Appeals. So if you think about it in those terms, a novel issue of statewide significance. That's a lot, yeah. right? And and yeah. my goodness, in my years on the court, um, we had we had a few death cases when we had a death penalty in New York State. Uh, the education case is mm -hmm. one that was very close to my heart. Uh, funding of public schools, um, the same-sex marriage case. Uh, but when you think about it, I. Every case is important by definition. You had definition. a death penalty also, general death penalty. We, uh, during my 25 years on the Court of Appeals, we had first one death penalty when I arrived there, which uh, it was like my first year on the court. It was mm. just an amazing welcome to the Court of Appeals mm. because I had been basically a commercial lawyer. Uh, I arrived at the Court of Appeals to find this docket that's just breathtaking, you know, real people's really important problems. And among those cases that first year was a death penalty case. It was the last vestige of the old death penalty that we had in New York State. And uh, we, the court struck it down as unconstitutional in a 4-3 vote, and I wrote that decision mm. that first year. You can imagine how mm. terrifying that was yeah. for me. But then uh, a few years went by. We, uh, there was a change in, in the leadership of the state government. Uh, and in the Pataki years, the legislature adopted a new death penalty. And again, those cases came to us. And so I had those at the beginning and at the end of my tenure on the court. Yeah. Still, it's interesting, still an issue that Isn't it very something? much divides the country, yeah. very much. I wonder why that, because I don't, it's just something well, I can't it's, understand. People feel very yeah. strongly about it. Yeah. And, and I, I note this year, and this is something that was especially important to me, uh, we had we had an earlier case a couple of years ago in the Supreme Court of the United States where the court struck down, just wiped off the books, uh, death penalty for juveniles. And just this year, a couple of weeks ago, the Supreme Court said life without parole was unconstitutional for juveniles too. So these are issues that continue to divide the country at the legislative level and then at the judicial level as well. Do you uh, think... Uh, I, I, we, don't, we don't have that much time, and I hate to get off I'm track. I'm sorry to no, hear that's that. All right. I know we could go on for. 
do you think that the political uh, politicians who, who vote these laws, who make these laws, are reflective of the general public? Or are they afraid of the general public? Well, I guess it's a little bit of both, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. So that would be an I interesting do. analysis. Yeah. I mean, people have to get right. elected and re-elected. Right. And the, on mm -hmm. the other hand, yeah. we all vote for them, yeah. so they do both. You right? did. You wrote the dissent on the gay on the same-sex marriage. I did. I did. And that was uh, considered. Uh, that was a great disappointment to a lot of people, but you were terrific on it. Well, what's interesting, I just had a card from a law clerk whose marriage I performed several years ago. Uh, it was their anniversary, and they wrote to remind yeah. me of their anniversary and how beautiful the, the ceremony was. And I wrote back to them to remind them of something, which is they are responsible for the first paragraph oh, of that written. dissent. And the reason is that I stood there between the two of them. This was a young couple that had lived together for many, many years. There was no reason on earth that they needed to be married. You know, yeah. they had everything. Yeah. Um, and yet it was important for them to stand before me. Um, and and they, they said this in the time that they talked to me, that a time had come in their relationship where they just needed to make a public pledge and a public commitment to one another that they would be devoted to one another throughout their entire lives. And, and, and you know, that's kind of the essence of the first paragraph of my dissent, yeah, how much, how so much that matters to people. Yeah. Did you ever think before you became chief judge or judge, just the plain judge, um, that you would be considered to be so progressive? Oh my goodness, what did I think of myself? <laughs> I, I, you know, I was born and grew up in Monticello, New York. In yeah. fact, outside of, in, in something even smaller than Monticello. Uh, my parents uh, would have been, they were immigrants to this country. They would have been thrilled if I, well, becoming a teacher for them was mm, the, the base, absolute yeah. capstone. That, yeah. that was what they hoped and prayed I would do to get educated and to become a teacher. Uh, so did I ever think I would be a judge, let alone the chief judge? There were no women judges back at that time. I think we had one woman lawyer in town, but I, I didn't know her. Um, so the, the simple answer to your question is, oh my goodness, no. Did you think you would? I've never decided what I want to be. That's my problem. <laughs> well, at I least I still, you did very well. I still well. have that problem, too. <laughs> I still have that problem. I have that problem at my law firm which tell, told me, come here and do whatever you want to do, which is an incredible Very, offer, yeah. isn't it? Yes, the absolutely. Problem, the problem that I have is I want to do everything. <laughs> I, I everything everything in, interests me. Yeah. The, the litigation interests me. Yeah. The arbitration interests me. And, of course, my heart is with the juveniles. Yeah. And, and I, I certainly want to continue to, to do things that we started in the area of juveniles. And I'm so pleased to see today that suddenly people have awakened to the fact that we have to reach out to do something to improve the lives of kids. Mm. I mean, it's the kids' lives, sure, but hey, it's ours too. And it also know? affects us in That's such right. an incredible it's way. Ours. And it, it comes back us. and back and back. And our nation too. What are we, <sighs> what are we doing for future generations? You know, suddenly everyone is awakening to the fact that we have to do something. All the, there's all this publicity on these uh, juvenile detention facilities, you know, the Department of Justice mm -hmm. investigated. These are places we take kids uh, from home and school and friends and family and send them up to the Canadian border where the, the Department of Justice has just documented that, that the, these are the, what we're doing to the kids is just awful. So it's wonderful that we're looking at this and that we're going to close, uh, Commissioner Carrion is, a great spokesperson. We're going to close a lot of these facilities. It's real, but hey, let's turn the clock back a little bit and see what we can do to help keep kids from getting into the court system in the first place. And there's so many different things that go into that. Their education and so many ways to Teachers help. Teachers and schools. So many everything. ways to help. Absolutely. And, and suddenly we're awakened to the need and the to housing. do that. Everything. I mean, a everything. child who gets moved around is living in a shelter with a. F a part of some parent in the in the household that's abusive. Exactly. What are you, what? Exactly. Yeah. And domestic violence. I mean, my Absolutely. goodness, how we have, how we have um, sharpened our awareness of of what needs what to be done and what goes yeah. into it. Uh, yeah. It's just incredible that we. It takes us so long to learn these lessons. It does. But again, I'm back to the first message. We <laughs> we celebrate and we grieve. It's taken us too long, but we're there. So let's do it. Let's do it. When you uh, were a litigator, did you feel that you wanted to do something bigger than that? 
Uh, when I was a litigator, well, uh, in the early years, they were my childbearing years, too, so I, I can never forget the stresses of those early years with three little kids all at the same time. Always throughout my career uh, as a lawyer with law firms, always I was uh, affiliated in some way with the Legal Aid Society, and always I was affiliated with the Bar Association. So there were, I always had interests that transcended the law firm, but it was a real juggling act back, to, back in those days to, Did, to do were, everything. Were you an activist judge? <laughs> what is, what this? is that? What, what do they it? talk about? Well, this I, think, activist? I think an activist judge is anybody you disagree with. It's, right? it's very good. Yes, very I good. think that's that's the, really the yeah. definition. I mean, I can't understand the Republicans talking about activist judges because I think some of their judges are extremely activists. Yeah, that's a it's just, just that's their just, interpretation. It's just You're right. a big yeah. stain to put yeah. on somebody, right? Yeah. And uh, absolutely. And if you think about how the law is made, and and I've so often reflected on the it's a quarter century that I was so privileged to be at the state's high court. Uh, what you're there for? Can I, can I tell you just a little story mm -hmm. that about a, a very early lesson that mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very fond of? I think about this story a lot. I had just gotten on the court, as you pointed out, the first woman. Uh, there's a mandatory retirement age at the court I was of seventy. I'm going to come to talk about that. Okay. I will come. Uh, but here I was. I was 45 years old. Uh, I was the first woman, and three of the judges, four of the judges, were about to become 70 years old. Mm. Uh, I, I had 25 wonderful years on the court, but can you imagine how I was treated that first year by four 70-year-old gentlemen, uh, and no. the first woman on the court? Terrible. So one of the first cases that came to the court, and what I remember so well, concerned uh, whether a person could recover damages in an accident where the person wasn't injured at all, but simply witnessed somebody else being injured. We emotional distress damages, we call those. That mm -hmm. some in this case it was a child who was hurt. And mm -hmm. the question was, could the mother recover damages when the mother was not hurt at all? And uh, one of my colleagues was the reporting judge on the case. The law definitely said no in the state of New York. He reported to reverse the lower courts and say, yes, you can, you, we'll allow that to go forward. Well, it came my turn, and I said, you know, I'm dissenting. I'm not joining in that. That's not the law of the state of New York. And I went through the entire law of the state of New York, and he, he said, with due respect, I know that's not the law of the state of New York. I think we should change the law of the state of New York a bit because times have changed, other That's jurisdictions have changed, the law has changed in other respects. That was such a good lesson for me, and I, I, I'm addressing your point about yeah. activist judges, yeah. uh, because what judges have to do is be attentive to all of the arguments that are put before them. You don't just look at cases that you've decided 50 years ago or 25 right. years ago and say, that's the law and we're not budging from the law. Right. You, because it's the lawyers... put it in with the environment and... Well, the lawyers the put all learned. of that before you right. and you have to just, that's what you're there for, not simply to rubber stamp, not to move something from the old book into the new book, but to... So to be an activist judge is basically being a good judge. Well, when you're or a was, good judge, yeah. well, I say when I disagree with the judge's opinion, I, a judge's decision, I, that thought crosses my mind, too. So I'm, I think, I think <laughs> it's, just, it's just a bad label. Yeah. It can be thrown onto yeah. things. But, but judges should be open yeah. to changes in society. Now, why should judges have to retire at the age of 70? Well, it's an Is easy... Is it judges or justices? Uh, on, this, on the Court of Appeals of the State of New York, we say there is no justice. We're all judges. <laughs> um, on some of the other courts, the Supreme Court, for example, our initial mm -hmm. entry court, they, they are justices. The Constitution provides that at age 70, you step down and gives you a 14-year term, too. Um, and uh, the 14-year term uh, got into our Constitution because that was the average age, the average number of years judges with life tenure used to serve. Today, if you... Because we live so much longer. That's right. Today, it would be much longer. But uh, it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult and interesting question about the retirement at age 70. If I could have... If, if it said 71, if the law said 72, believe me, I would have been there. You had just been reappointed. I would have, I would you have were the been first there. person to be reappointed, yeah, too. Yeah, but I would have been there till the curtain fell. Yeah. There's no way I would have left something that was so dear to me. They serve for life. 
They serve for life. They and, serve uh, for life. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, the way we got our 14-year term is by figuring out what the average number of years was that the life term judges got. But the age 70 has been in our Constitution for a very, very long time. The Supreme Court judges, the trial judges, they can get three two-year extensions. They can go to 76, but for all the rest of us, it's retirement age. So we age. need to have a constitutional well, convention I, I, to change, I don't and know it's how a big I've, thing. I don't know. You've raised yeah. two interesting points. First, on the retirement at age 70, today, the irony is we're youthful enough at age 70. I, I feel... You know, I feel blessed to be strong and healthy, and I, mm. I have a lot I want to do. Mm. So being forced off the court while it broke my heart, I, I hope that I have years to, to do good and do important things. Whether we should have a constitutional convention is a really yeah, interesting probably, question. Yeah. Isn't that a great question? Yes, it is. Because the Constitution we think of as a strong and immutable document and the foundation of our nation and the foundation of our yes. state, but our Constitution, our state Constitution, provides for a constitutional convention, <laughs> or at least that we, the people of the state can decide whether they want one. Right. And that's a question we're going to have to face in a couple of years. Do we want one? It's I don't a, know. It's a question that many people fear. It's a good, yes. Yeah. Some people because fear which, it. what may happen, that's what the right, changes That's right. That's right. Scary. Well, you know, we're, we've come to the end of our oh, no. program, and we haven't even begun to <laughs> no, talk about that some is of the these truth. things. So um, I certainly hope you are going to come back. I wanted, it's my pleasure to be with I, you. I really wanted to discuss the community support and the different courts that, you've, that were established and what the unified court system means and all I, of these different things. I would very things. much like to do that. So I hope you will. And I am really sorry there was a retirement age because <laughs> I think that we would have benefited well, from your presence well, let's so much. Hope, let's hope society will benefit from my presence I th anyway. I'm sure it will. Thank you. Thank you, Ju Judith Kay. Thank you. Yeah. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.